Well, good morning, Salem. I'm so glad to see all of you this morning. It's an exciting day for us to uh, begin a new series here in November. I heard that uh, we're finally going to hit 70 degrees on Tuesday. Can we say amen? Amen. Woo! You know, when I first moved down here from uh, the Midwest, you all told me to wait till September 15th, and you're all a bunch of liars. Um, So then I've always been waiting until October 15th, and apparently this year we get to wait until the (laughs) first week in November, but uh, cooler weather's coming. So I'm grateful you're all here. We're kicking off a new series today called Inheritance. Uh, Vince and I are going to team teach this one for the month of uh, November as we kind of lean into the topic of generosity. And we're actually going to do a deep dive into the story of the Good Samaritan. And so instead of doing four different stories, we're going to kind of really go deeper into that particular story. As a matter of fact, today I'm not even going to get to the story. I'm only going to deal with the four verses in front of it. There's such a value to understanding what context these stories are told in. You know, when Jesus told the parables, it was always in response to a question that was asked, and he used them as teaching tools. And so before we even get to the the actual parable itself, we're going to lean in as to understand uh, what question Jesus was answering, and why was the guy even asking the question that he was asking? I think it'll be a valuable journey for us to do today. So as you wrestle through uh, this month, I want you to be just kind of thinking through this particular word, inheritance, and understanding where we're going with that. So when you hear the word inheritance, what's the first word that comes to mind? What do we typically think of? An inheritance has to do with what? Yeah. So it's either money or stuff or whatever the case may be. And here's the interesting thing about um, this whole idea of an inheritance. I've walked enough life with people, and in my particular role in life, I'm Uh, sometimes sitting with people when they're at the very end of life. And it's always interesting to me what starts to happen with families when they start dealing with end-of-life issues, and then we start dealing with inheritance kind of stuff, and you start thinking in terms of what inheritance really is about. And there's a side of us that actually believes that we're entitled to an inheritance. Like, they're my parents, or they're my grandparents, so therefore the stuff is mine. And I think sometimes it's really helpful for us to take this gargantuan step back, isn't it? For us to be able to just think for a moment what that sounds like and what that looks like as we consider for just a moment that the stuff that we're saying is ours, that we deserve it, that we're entitled to it, the reality is, is that underneath the surface of this whole inheritance thing is this issue, which is what we want to lean into. You see, you realize the stuff that you're saying you're entitled to, you had nothing to do with. You didn't earn it. It's not yours. But somehow you believe that you're the one who deserves it. Take a step back for just a moment and wrestle through again. When somebody chooses to give you something, it's out of an act of generosity. And the thing that sits behind generosity in most cases is a care and a concern for other people. Dare I say the word love. And so you're going to see this come all the way back around when I close this thing out today. So I want you to lean into this concept of inheritance because here's the thing that's interesting. If you look statistically speaking, what ends up happening is when we're talking about inheritance in this particular passage, this particular parable, Jesus isn't just talking about eternity. He's talking about this life. And we think in terms of what we've been given and all the resources that have been given into this country. We are the the wealthiest country in the world per capita. And then you start leaning into that and all the stuff that we've been given to steward. And what do we do with that? And then we wrestle through what we do with it at the end of life. And statistically, do you realize that if you give everything that you have to your kids, they'll squander most of it in less than 10 years. So now all the kids and the grandkids in the room are mad at me. You'll get over it. It'll all be okay. Your mom and dad will probably still give it all to you anyways. But here's the thing. I think we've been called the steward at all. And to be able to think in terms of who gave it to us, whose it is in the first place, our world would say that it all belongs to us. And what God says is, no, praise God from whom all what? Blessings flow. So if it all came from him in the first place, then what we're called to do is steward it well in this life, to be able to help people understand the life to come. So let's lean into this thing, the whole idea of inheritance and generosity. So this whole thing opens up, and I love this. This, I I don't know what it is about people that they want to be able to test Jesus all the time, but we've got this expert in the law. So think in terms of uh, these guys got very frustrated with Jesus because they didn't have, uh, Jesus didn't have the the, the letters before or after his name that that he was supposed to have, to be able to be speaking with the kind of authority that he was talking with. 
And to be able to question uh, kind of the, uh, the law of the land, particularly when it came to the religious structure of the day. And so these teachers of the law, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, these kind of guys, they're, they're just frustrated with this guy because he's not a reverend, he doesn't have a PhD at the end, he doesn't have a doctor of ministry. It's just this, this poor kid that grew up in Nazareth, was a carpenter's son, and now suddenly he speaks with all this authority. Like, who in the world do you think you are, Jesus? I appreciate the fact that you do a few, you know, miracles and stuff every once in a while, but like, where do you get your authority from? And so these guys would, on a regular basis, try to test Jesus to be able to see if maybe he would give some answer that they could blow him up on. And as we all know, when you're messing with God, you're probably not going to win that deal. So here's what ends up happening. So this expert of law stands up and he says to Jesus, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So I want to pull that up for just a moment. Here's the thing. We often ask the wrong question. You see, as Christ followers, we know when you pull this thing back that that's really not the question. But we live in 21st century United States of America. All of you have grown up in a household where somebody probably said something along the lines of, nothing in this life is what? Nothing in this life is free. Hmm. And yet Jesus is the one that wants to be able to walk in and say, maybe in most cases a lot of things aren't free, but there's one thing in life that is free, and it's the greatest thing ever. And so inside of us, we struggle with this. We just don't know what to do with it. And so everything inside of us wants to figure out, what do I have to do? There's got to be something I have to do in order to gain this. What is it? And so this guy's standing up in front of Jesus, and he's asking what seems like a legitimate, logical question. Hey, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? There's another story in Scripture where a guy asks the same question. He's the rich guy, and if you remember that one, it's the story where Jesus talks about, you know, go sell everything you have, give your money to the poor, then come and follow me. And then he says it'd be easier for a rich man to enter, it'd be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. And that scripture says that that man walked away sad because there's a man of much wealth. This one's a different scenario, but the same question. What must I do? We've got to take a step back and remind ourselves that it's not about what we do, it's about what he's done, and that's the whole point. Now, again, give these guys a little bit of a break because in this particular time, Jesus hasn't died yet because clearly Jesus is standing right there to be able to ask the question. We're in the 21st century, we get the privilege of the, the whole idea of hindsight is 2020, and so we get to look back and we know what Jesus ultimately does. He winds up on the cross, he walks out of the grave, he lives triumphantly, has a place prepared for us until we are called home. So give these guys a little bit of a break to be asking the question that they're asking, but at the same time, it's still the question that we wrestle with at moments if we're not careful. What must I do? And what I want you to hear from me again today is it's not what we do. The reality is is we can't do anything to get ourselves back within God's good graces. All we can do is keep pushing him away, walking away, doing the things that we're not supposed to do, and yet God's grace keeps coming in. And what he accomplished for us on the cross is he took our sins on his shoulders, paid for him, walked out of the grave to promise us that one day we'll spend eternity with him. That's the inheritance. But here's the thing. Sometimes when we read something like this, I think we lean into this idea that we're only talking about eternity. And what I want you to hear from me over these next four weeks is that really what this guy is asking is a very different question. He does want to know where he's going to spend eternity, but that's not really in many ways the way that they would talk in Jesus' day. What they were trying to figure out was this. How do I get the best life possible today? I think if we're being honest, we still ask that same question, don't we? Depending upon what you're walking through in your life, there's a side of you that feels like life just isn't turning out the way you thought it would. Maybe your marriage isn't where you thought it would be. Maybe your kids aren't behaving the way you thought they would your parents, job, whatever it might be. And so we're always asking this question, how can I get more out of life? How can I find more joy, more purpose, more whatever it might be? And so as we lean into those topics, we, we find ourselves in many cases going to very different places besides God's Word to be able to get the answer for that. 
I went to this fascinating place called Google. You've probably heard of it. And I simply typed that in, 10 steps to a happy life. You can imagine, I got a few answers back. But all I wanted to see was what does our world suggest is the way that we get to a happy life. Because at the end of the day, that's really what this guy is asking. Jesus, teacher of the law, tell me, what must I do in order to be able to have a successful, purpose-driven, valuable, joy-filled life today? And have the confidence that someday when I breathe my last, I'm going to be in paradise. So here's what Google says. Believe it or not, it was kind of fascinating. I I started reading through a bunch of different lists, and it was amazing to me how many of the lists were very much the same. But if you start looking at this, so fascinating. Do things for others. Oh, let's notice others around you. Oh, let's live for something bigger. Oh, let's let's try to be positive. You know, you can read the list. You guys are already reading it. But here's the fascinating part to me that I always find interesting with our culture. Our culture likes to throw this kind of stuff out there, and we get amazed by the person that seems to be skinnier than us, who looks younger than us, who seems to have more money than us, who seems to have a happier marriage than us, seems to smile more than us, seems to have better behaved kids than we have, drives a nicer car than us. I don't care what the issues that you're looking at, but for some reason you put that person up there because they have something that you don't have, and you're amazed by it, and you think, I want what that guy has. And so then you go, well, that guy must have a whole lot of wisdom in him, so let's go listen to that guy. And here's the wild part. Scripture says there's nothing new under the sun. Huh. Number one, if you want to have a happy life, try doing something for somebody else. shocking. If you begin to understand and get below what the question is, this isn't a new question. And there's not a new answer. And so when you begin to look at this story that Jesus shares as we dive into it, you're going to see that really what Jesus is saying is if you want to experience a purpose-filled, joy-filled life, Stop focusing so much on yourself. Even our world has drawn that conclusion. I mean, yes, we got to take care of ourselves so we can take care of others, be yourself great. I, you know, you, you can start looking at this stuff, but do things for others. So Jesus, in typical Jesus fashion, I love what he winds up doing. He's the guy that's looking around the room, and he knows that this guy's testing him. He's God, after all. It's usually a, a, not a good idea to try to argue with God. So here he tries to test Jesus in front of a whole bunch of people. Jesus knows exactly what's going on. So this teacher of the law who has the letters before and after his name, Jesus looks right at him instead of answering the question, asks him a question back. And what does he say? He says, well, hey, dude, what's written in the law? You're the guy that knows it. How do you read it? To which the guy responds, well, here's here's what it says. To which Jesus, I can just imagine Jesus is smiling as the guy's answering this question, right? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Great. This first part is taken from a passage out of Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. Some people call it the Shema. That's a Hebrew word. And look, Deuteronomy, if you're not familiar with this, it stands for second law. Deutero stands for second. Nomi is the word for law, so second law. This is after the Israelites have wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. An entire generation of people have died off. Moses is about to get taken up on a mountain, and God's going to take him home. He's handing off the baton of leadership to Joshua, and so he's got the whole Israelite community in front of him. And keep in mind, these, these ones were all little kids when they went through the Red Sea and all the stuff that happened in this unbelievable moment in history. And so now they're adults, they're about to cross the Jordan River and go into the promised land, receive all this stuff, right? And so the second law is given, so Moses has just shared again the Ten Commandments, and after he shares the Ten Commandments, he basically looks at him and says, so that's at the end of um, Deuteronomy chapter 5, and then Deuteronomy chapter 6, he basically looks at him and says, look, whatever you do, for the love of all that is good and green, don't forget this stuff. Write it on the doorpost of your house, stick it to your head. Tattoo it on yourself. I don't care what you do. Talk about it in the streets. Talk about it at the table with your kids when you're walking in the car, when you're, whatever it is. Don't forget this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then in Leviticus 19, verse 18, if you want to go back and look at that, 
talks about loving your neighbor as yourself. So here's this learned guy. Went through seminary, asks the question. Jesus says, well, what do you know? He rattles off Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 19.18. You know what Jesus says? Okay. Looks like you got it. Love God. Love people. Seems pretty simple, right? I I think you've got to kind of lean into this for just a moment. We could spend a whole lot of time this morning peeling apart what does it mean to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, but I don't have the time to dive into each of those words separately. But in essence, what, what Moses was saying to the people, what God continues to say to us through his word is start by loving me with everything you got. You don't get to pick and choose. You don't get to say, well, I like these certain things. I'll do these certain things. This stuff's a little questionable. Not doing that. God's saying, start with me. And as we start with him, what we remind ourselves of is the love that he's shown for us. We just finished singing a song that says how deep the Father's love for us. I think each one of us in this room has our own story of what that looks like. And the more we live life, the more we begin to understand what it means to have the deep love of the Father. And then what does it mean to really love our neighbor as ourselves? And I think the order matters. I love this particular picture because it shows this guy who's got a full battery and a guy who's got a a low battery. And as he's shaking his hand, I mean, the the idea as Christ followers is is to continue to pour into others and continue to bring the love of God to others so that they can experience that. But here's the deal, man. Like, people are exhausting. Anybody agree that people are exhausting sometimes? Okay, so four of you. I would suggest any of you with your hands raised right now, don't look to your right or your left. (laughs) Any of you that are married, you know that people can be exhausting. Any of you that are parents, people can be exhausting. Any of you that own a company, people are exhausting. But yet we're called to love people. And that's where Jesus gets to. Because what we want to be able to do is say that we love certain people. And what Jesus leans into is that we're called to love all people. But if we try to love all people, but we don't start with the order that says that we love God first so that he can keep charging up our battery, then we'll get to be the ones who have the low battery. So it's important to do this in the order. Love God, love people. Got it. So then Jesus says, you've answered correctly. Do this. Now you guys are all looking at me saying, Tim, you told us it's not what we do, and you'll live. Get the order right. Like, we're not talking about justification here, we're talking about sanctification. Big words in the church that basically mean justification is about how we are saved. We're saved because of what Jesus did on the cross. We're saved because of what he, what he won on the cross. And as he walked out of the grave, the promise of eternity. That's not, we're, we're, you don't do anything to get that. He did that. The do this is you just ask, what must I do to experience joy, purpose, fulfillment in life? And Jesus is looking at you saying, start by loving me and feeling my love. And then go out and love people likewise. You do that, you'll find fulfillment and joy. Jesus says you did it. How many of you like it when you get an A? I love it. I live for A's. I was that stinking kid that would sit next to the teacher's desk. I'd get a 98 on a test and I'd show up at his desk and I'd want to argue the two points I got wrong. And he would just look at me like, oh, brother, here comes Nick Kirk again. I've had to apologize for that over the years. Now I only question if I get a 95. I'm kidding. What's interesting is we struggle with this, don't we? So you get the A on the test, and we keep pushing. Because in essence, Jesus let the guy ask the question, let him answer his own question. Jesus goes, good point. Do that. But what the guy really wanted was for Jesus to say, you've done it, not go do it. He wanted to say, check. He wanted to justify himself. What a word. So he asked Jesus, can you imagine how this goes? 
I think trying to justify yourself to God is probably an exercise in futility. So he asked Jesus the question, and I, I don't know what his demeanor might have been, but clearly he was already trying to test Jesus. Now he's frustrated with Jesus' answer. So now he's like, well, then who is my neighbor, Jesus? And I think what he wanted to hear was some very specific things. So that he could go, check, check, check. And instead, Jesus tells a story. And in the process of telling the story, blows up the paradigm. Who's my neighbor? Have you ever tried to justify yourself to God? You want to talk about an exercise in futility. You see, there's this side of us that wants to assume that there's going to be this moment, right? Where we, where we get like our moment to, to face God and, and we've got our attorney and he's got his attorney and we're going to have this moment where we talk about all the things that we did right and then, then there's going to be the cross-examination where they kind of put aside, yeah, but Tim, what about the time that you, or how about the time that you didn't? And it's in those moments that I want to be able to say, yeah, but God did, but, but we got to put this in context. I mean, the guy, the, but, we want to be able to justify ourselves and say, this is the reason I didn't do what I was supposed to do. This is the reason I did this. This is the, we always want to justify. And what Jesus is saying is just stop. Understand that what you're called to do is love God because he loved you first and then go and do that to others. Don't try to justify yourself. You're going to blow it. It's the whole reason I came in the first place. So when others blow it, my goodness, stop being so surprised and stop trying to justify yourself. And so the ultimate question is we lean in and we kind of close out this first week of the heart of generosity. The guy says, sort of, probably in a little bit of a snippy tone, and who is my neighbor? Jesus. Because what he really wanted Jesus to do is go, you know, the five people around you that you've been nice to. And instead, what Jesus goes into that we'll lean into next week is he blows this guy's paradigm wide open. And he forces the guy to have to wrestle through, am I really loving God with everything I got? And am I in turn loving people the way he's called me to love them. Because I want to put neighbor into a box that I can check and say, done. And Jesus is saying, there's a whole lot of people in this world that you don't agree with, that don't think like you, that do things that you disagree with, and I'm calling you to love them too. So what's at the heart of generosity? I would argue it's this. We love because we first experienced love. So what does generosity look like? What does an inheritance come from? It comes from the love of the Father. Let's pray. Father God, we thank and praise you for your amazing love for us. We begin this morning by confessing the fact that there's been way too many times in our lives where we've attempted to justify ourselves to you and to give you all the reasons why we think we deserve certain things or why we don't deserve other things. And it sure is amazing, God, how much we like to receive grace when we need it and how much we don't want you to dole it out when it doesn't seem fair to others. And yet as we gather together in this place, we continue to be reminded as we just sang that song that I hear the mocking voice as I recognize that it was my sin that put you on that cross. God, your love for us is so amazing, so overwhelming. In many ways, we don't even really understand it, and we don't fully know what to do about it. But then when we spend a little bit of time in your presence again this morning, we're reminded that what you call us to do is to receive your love again 
and then go out and do likewise. God, that's how we find purpose in life. It doesn't really matter what Google says. It matters what you say. So God, thanks for loving us. Thanks for dying for us, rising for us, and thanks for giving us a life with purpose. Until that day, we confidently know that we'll spend eternity with you, not because of what we've done, but because of what you accomplished on the cross. God, we thank you for your unbelievable love for us. Continue to use us that we might be generous with others with your love and with all that you've blessed us with. God, these things we ask in your precious and holy name.